So here's an interesting like phrase during the remote viewing of this. It was fun in the beginning and exciting, and then things got really bad. Who are the adversaries here, first of all, that, he, that he's talking about? Nuclear energy is in the material that we don't even understand coming off of nuclear devices. They are interested in that. They are interested in collecting it. Physics tells you that the heat would have to travel up. Heat goes up. So the top of these things would be very hot. They're not. The bottoms are hot. What's going on? When we remote view Roswell, and other remote viewers have too, we've got this, this uh, intense energetic type of radar pulse. When you think about the, the UFO wars that Ed Grimsley was filming, that you can probably still see, and the TR-3B, that is part of that fighting. He is trying to move into a position where he doesn't get killed based on everything that he knows and everything that he's potentially experienced. Oh, man. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Metaphysical Podcast. We've talked about David Grush's testimony he gave to Congress and the interview he did with News Nation. But we know you're dying to hear professional remote viewer John Vivanco's RV data that he found. Who are the adversaries Grush avoided naming in his interview? Why has there been a UFO cover up at all? How have these craft been taken down if there is an entire crash retrieval program established within all these countries? What does radar have to do with it all? And most importantly, why is Grush really coming out as a whistleblower? Well, join John and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, as we answer all of these burning questions, plus bring up an interesting clip from Tucker Carlson talking about evidence of UFOs. So let's get started with a show that's out of this world. And you're listening to us. If you're listening to us, uh, uh, watching us on a video platform like Spotify, Apple Podcast, YouTube, Rumble, Ganjing World, or somewhere else, anywhere else, just leave us a five-star rating and review. It really helps us. And make sure you like and subscribe. Ring that bell to keep watching these things that are coming out like hotcakes. Yeah. John, how you doing? Yeah. Good. It's I'm excited good about this one. Yeah, I mean, we've got some really interesting data surrounding some of these questions. Excited to yeah. get into it. Yeah, and you know, I think people, you know, we were having this conversation in, in our last episode, but it's like I think people forget how just how much already is out there that now has to be looked at anew with Grush coming out as a whistleblower. I mean, we've got a lot of not unintelligent investigative researchers that are doing work that have gotten information, but they haven't necessarily released them or released that information. You know, what, what else is out there? Um, you know, it was probably several months ago, Tucker Carlson uh, was on a podcast with a couple of guys. It's called full send podcast. That's right. And Tucker actually, you know, makes a very interesting interview here with these guys you know, he's he's kind of talking very candidly about stuff, dropping F-bombs and asking questions about what's really going on out there and some of the things that have shocked him uh, the most. About six minutes here that gets like really, really interesting where the guys are asking him questions very directly um, about any evidence that he's seen of, of UAPs and what interests him as a journalist. And he says the UFO, the UFO topic has really interested him. And he says that it was because he 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 grew up in a world where none of this stuff existed where you listen to the media and you don't you don't like question what the media sends that you or says that you believe your government officials and now everything is very turned upside down for him where he he feels actually regrets having that feeling and this really fascinates him because it's so far out there and there's actual evidence and proof that you know these things indeed exist why don't we go ahead and play a little clip here and then we'll kind of interrupt it to to comment and then we'll we'll keep going from there just to the first question is is this real or am i just being a crazy person who's spending too much time on the internet well this summer we got a call we didn't reach out this person called us lexi who's standing right there who's a genius one of our producers gets his call from this guy who's a tenured stanford medical school professor and he wants to come on the show. Now, this guy has a couple patents, and so he's rich. And he's got tenure at one of the most prestigious schools in the world. So, like, 
he's not a flake. He comes on and he's like, 11 years ago, the U.S. government reached out to me because I'm an expert on head injuries, on brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries as a physician. And they had all these court cases from families of U.S. servicemen, over 100, who'd been killed by UFOs. And the Department of Defense was refusing to give them death benefits or medical benefits. And I'm like, and he's like, so they're in the courts. And I was like, there are over 100 servicemen killed by UFOs? Like, what? He's like, yeah. And there are court cases about it. I'm like, why isn't this on the front page of the New York Times? I don't know. But he goes, I'm involved in it. I'm the, you know, I'm one of the researchers. I'm the expert witness in these cases. What does that mean? And he's like, for example, uh, UFOs appear to be tra attracted for whatever reason to nuclear energy. So at nuclear missile bases in the upper Midwest, for example, nuclear powered aircraft carriers, nuclear powered submarines are all getting buzzed by these objects, including underwater. Okay, pause there, Lindsay. He's like flies on old food. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a really good way to describe that. That's really funny. Dang um, UFOs. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, get out of my way. Uh, yeah, he, he dropped a bunch of stuff there that's really interesting, just as peripheral data to this entire conversation that, that we've got going on here, which is that there is really there really is evidence of this stuff out there. I mean, we, we've got. Tucker Carlson saying a, a tenured Stanford Institute or is it Stanford University um, rather professor coming out with and he's an expert on brain injuries and he's been contacted by the U.S. government to help them figure this out. I mean, these guys have been injured and or killed by exotic technology. They get too close to it. Right. I mean, that's that I've heard I've heard the stories as well. Uh, as far as court cases go, that's very fascinating. So, so those would be one interesting ones to follow along with, um, if they're, if they're still going on and that what happened to them? I mean, did these things become classified court cases become classified? I mean, how, how do they, how does the Pentagon military deal with this type of disclosure? That specifically is really fascinating to me. Now it's like, as far as the nuclear sites and nuclear energy, we've seen this before when it comes to, um, some projects we worked on that were more like expedition style, where we've looked at phenomena that's incurred in an area like around an old defunct nuclear power plant. And, and in the process of looking at this area where people claim the UFOs were coming down around this power plant, they were trying to collect material that had been spent and gone into the environment, in the air, in the ground, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, there is a definitely an interest that they have in this material. It's kind of like they have methods of collecting it and understanding aspects of it that we don't, that they can measure and go after. And that's why we also see that in some mines that humans have abandoned, where humans have felt they, they, they can't do any more to get uh, gold out or whatever mineral they're looking for, you'll often find that there's a UFO presence going into those to continue the mining because they have the technology know-how to get more out of it. So, yeah. Well, and these, and these substances are, are useful and precious to them as well somehow. Right. They are. Yeah. Nuclear energy is in the material that we don't even understand coming off of nuclear devices or bent material, whatever. They are interested in that. They are interested in collecting it. They're also interested in like trying to understand what humans are going to destroy next with it. We're children of war. We're mammals are children of war is, is what I've seen. And what about these brain, these brain injuries, John? Like, have you come across anything like that in your, you know? I don't know what he's talking about. When the, with the brain injuries and the soldiers, I have heard off and on that, you know, UFO attacks. Well, UFO attacks. So, okay. I mean, this, this goes down this big rabbit hole of what Grush was talking about with the adversaries. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to go there yet. Okay. But, we'll get into that. Yeah. We'll get into that in a little bit. I, I hear you. I get it. That's a big one. There's evidence of, of brain injuries from exotic technology, right? But Tucker didn't stop there. There was more that he talked about regarding his information with these UAPs that I think we'll just go ahead and pull this up and listen to a little bit more right now. 
And in a number of cases, these things have landed on military bases, including famously in Germany, in West Germany in the 70s. And servicemen have approached them like, what is this thing? There's this like giant glowing thing on the base. And they approach and they get traumatic brain injury. Like they are rendered. Like, yeah, yeah. Just, they get brain damage or they're killed. And he studied their brains. And they have, this is all totally real. This is not, this is the Department of Defense, dude. And they've all had this damage from some kind of powerful energy that we cannot identify. So then this guy's like, wow, he's just a scientist. He never believed in UFOs. He's like, this is real. I cannot believe this is real. This is like crazy. He's supposed to do research on it. He's still at Stanford. And it turns out that actually, yes, these things have been shot down and crashed and the U.S. government has the wreckage and it's being held by defense contractors, Raytheon, Lockheed, which are big independent companies, but that work for the U.S. government, they're really part of the Department of Defense, but they're separate. So you can't, their sunshine laws don't apply to them. You can't actually get information from them. It's a very tricky way to hide information. And they have the wreckage from these crafts. Hmm. And I'm like, really? Are we positive these aren't like advanced Russian or Chinese? No, of course not. So is it more like the government or whatever is just this good at hiding it or people just don't care? Well, I think it's a combination of both. I think it's too big for people to metabolize. Like, if Prince Harry says something stupid, everyone's like, I can't believe Prince Harry. Because, like, that's manageable. You can, like, oh, this douchey fake prince with his stupid <laughs> wife from Santa Monica. Like, I get that. <laughs> but the idea that we're not alone in the universe and we're getting buzzed by these objects whose behavior defies physics, like, that just explodes too many categories in my head. I just can't deal with it. Okay, so for anyone out there who is a uh, Prince Harry fan, we apologize if you're offended by Tucker. What do you think of what we just watched, John? Okay, now it makes sense what he's talking about with the brain injuries. Yeah, um, that makes sense because, okay, so for instance, uh, I mean this 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 goes down into wacky world that a lot of people don't take seriously, even people who study and research UFOs. But if you look at Viktor Gerbenikov who <laughs> amazingly was an entomologist, a uh, Russian entomologist who, you know, mid-century up until not that long ago, he was studying these beetles in Siberia that he noticed that they would go straight up off of the water mm -hmm. as though they, they lifted off at full speed. So he's curious, you know, why would they do something like that? How come there's no ramp up to uh, sure. the speed, right? So... He, he took their, um, the chitin, the carpus that covers their wings off. And under a microscope, he noticed these microstructures on the underside of the, <clears throat> the wings. So he came through testing and, and, and trying to figure out what was going on. He came to the conclusion that these microstructures were responsible for an anti-gravity effect. Like when they're charged up through probably the, you know, the electrical body of the bug, they can cause a form of anti-gravity and a form of lift. So he took a bunch of the chitin from it. He lined the bottom of this board with it and put like handlebars on it. And then on the bottom of the board, he also put uh, like blinds that would open and close in order to control going up and down or forward and back. Right. So this is a crazy story. And you can actually look online. You can see pictures of his device. This device actually was in a Russian museum at one point, and it had disappeared. It's disappeared since then. Of course it has. Um, <clears throat> when I first saw this story, I'm like, nah, this is this ridiculousness. But we looked at it. We looked at it so many times, different angles. And yeah, you know, it seems to be this anti-gravity effect. Now, Grabenikov ultimately died from the effect of the electromagnetic field that it was that it was being created. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ultimately died from the elect electromagnetic effect. Oh, so it has a lot of, it, it can have a lot of problems. It can create a lot of problems for a human. Uh, the amount of energy that's being put off. I mean, even when you get to um, Louis Rota, who in 1915 created the aero radio ballistique, which was a claimed structure, he even demonstrated it for the press, that had anti-gravity. And he, he understood and he knew that the, the, the combination of electrostatic and electromagnetic energy that it creates. At one point, he touched the device, which didn't have a whole bunch of energy running through it, but it shocked him and knocked him out, went unconscious for 50 minutes. 
And when he came to, he's like, this, this doesn't make any sense because this thing doesn't hold enough energy to do that to me. So there's so many things that people don't understand about these devices that can, can do major damage to us. So if you ever see a UFO just sitting there, don't walk up to it. Use common <laughs> sense, kids. Don't walk up to UFOs just sitting in your front yard, okay? We should have a segment called Metaphysical Advice. <laughs> Metaphysical Advice. If you see a UFO in the forest, don't approach. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> walk away. Don't fast. go asking it for a ride. Walk away quickly. So very interesting stuff about these different people throughout history that have studied these things. I mean, and these go this, these things go back so long ago. Every episode we have, it shocks me more and more how unaware the person sitting at home is of what's really going on out there and what has already happened. I mean, the between 1890 and 1950, there was so much development on things that people are just shockingly unaware of. It's not even that hard to track it back. It's not that hidden. You can find it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, in the early 1900s, early 1900s in the U.S., I mean, there were in late 1800s, there were there were many scientists and inventors who were going after free energy and were going after anti-gravity and, and trying to understand all this stuff. That whole area got squeezed and shut down at a certain yeah. point. Tesla being yeah. one of the forerunners of that, actually. Right. OK, well, let, let's pull up this clip. Let's finish this off because there's one more major part I want you to listen to and hear and then we can talk about it. This the most interesting from my perspective, cons it's, I don't know if it's a consensus, but a lot of people, serious people, not crazy people who study this stuff, U.S. government employees seem to believe that these objects are coming from under the oceans. Boom. So the conventional view is they're coming in from outer space. There's not actually a lot of, you know, something enters the atmosphere. We can see it yeah, on satellite yeah. and there's not any evidence of that, actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's happening, but we don't know that it is. There's a lot of evidence these things are coming out of the ocean, including videotape of these objects coming out of the water at high speed or even more amazing, descending at Mach 3 into the water. And then, of course, we have a huge submarine what fleet. The f what the f Then we have a huge submarine fleet, American, but also Chinese and Russian, uh, underwater with pretty sensitive measurement devices, sonar, et cetera. And they have recorded these objects doing hundreds of knots underwater. So like, let's just stop there. Wait, what's knots? Uh, it's 1.1 miles per hour. It's oh. a way that we measure objects in the water. Oh. It's 1.1 miles. It's a little more than mile, mile per hour. And a, and a mile is a measurement that we use in the United States. Right. It's distinct from a kilometer, still which I think is right. Yeah. common in Canada. But anyway, <laughs> okay, these good. things are moving at impossibly high speeds. Basically, we're we're not really missing anything. That's the gist of it. He does talk a little bit about, you know, the idea that how hard it is to shoot even a bullet through the water and how even within like 50 feet, you can actually catch the bullet in the water because the resistance of the water is so great. The bullet just can't travel through it. How are these craft traveling through the water at this speed unless they're creating their own gravitational field within the craft, which could be screwing with people why they're going into the hospital if these electro, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, whatever that technology is. He also really interestingly talked about how they were doing heat maps of these ships or craft or whatever it is. And that the heat was always on the upper, uh, sorry, the lower part of the ship, which doesn't make any sense because physics tells you that the heat would have to travel up. Heat goes up. So the top of these things would be very hot. They're not. The bottoms are hot. What's going on? You know? Right. Well, you know, as far as the brain's concerned, hey, it's just Havana syndrome. So, yeah, put it on the shelf. You know, we, we, we figured it out. It's called Havana syndrome. That's actually an interesting thing. I think that they probably will come up with something, some term like Havana syndrome rather than directed energy weapon or brain scrambled by UFO um, in order to in order to cover this up. Right. But yeah, I mean, it's like it's that electromagnetic field, gravitational uh, time dilation. I mean, who knows what's going on in there? There's a lot of different things. And and I think that there's a lot of, yeah, BBS. BSS. Syndrome. <laughs> BSS I love how sorry. it starts with a BS already. Good one, Lindsay. That's, that's a good one. 
<laughs> Lindsay put up on screen for anyone listening, BSS, which is, uh, what was it? B brain scramble syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's good. Okay. So different frequencies, different frequencies, different magnetic interactions, magnetic field interactions are going to do different things to the brain. I mean, you can literally buy, um, the, the Koresh brain hat, the Shakti helmet, right? You can buy Todd Murphy actually makes these things, a, a, a neuroscientist. You connect it to a computer and it will pulse electromagnetic signals according to what you want to do into certain aspects, certain parts of your brain, hippocampus or amygdala, whatever. And it'll create certain feelings, certain effects. Even during solar storms, <clears throat> when our electromagnetic field is shifting and changing, it can cause effects. We've spoken of this before, right? It can cause like hallucinations. It can cause issues with the brain in general. It can cause people to be more emotional, what have you. Now think about a really high concentration of these fields in one area. I mean, that's going to, that's going to mess a person up. It's pretty, pretty interesting that who else, I mean, who knows what else Tucker has, you know, I mean, that, that interview was really interesting. So if you guys do want to watch that, um, I, I do recommend it. Uh, it was kind of cool to see Tucker just, just discuss like his career and stuff, but you know, a lot of PE is a contentious figure. Like not everyone likes Tucker Carlson, uh, right. but he seems pretty real. I, I mean, in this interview, especially, and, and I thought the, in, the UFO information was definitely, um, was definitely like interesting there. The next question really is, you know, with all of this, who's Grush? Who are, who are the adversaries here? First of all, that he, that he's talking about. So Grush, he avoid naming them. Do you have any more specifics for us? You did mention this a little bit in the last episode. Right. Okay. So, so when we look at that specific question, we don't get, uh, countries, human based constructs of, of, you know, Russia against the United States or China or whatever. We don't, we don't get anything like that. We don't get anything like that. In fact, the data revolves around subjects that the remote viewers identified as being aliens, as being aliens specifically, but so, but it, it actually narrows down in the data. So here's an interesting like phrase from one of the viewers during the remote viewing of this. It was fun in the beginning and exciting, and then things got really bad. Okay, so regarding what, what? Is, regarding who the adversaries are. So oh. let me explain what that is actually referencing. What that is referencing in the data is, or are the deals that were made at the outset with the grays, because see, here's what happened. These guys come in, the, the, they send a contingent of people to uh, authorities, like not necessarily, um, well, back then it, was, it would be the president. And, and that's what we hear, like Eisenhower or Truman in that, in that area. So they come in, they say, you know, we want to do this. We can do whatever we want. You could work with us or don't work with us. If you work with us, we'll make you a deal mm. and we'll give you some technology. So that's the fun part in the beginning. Oh my gosh, look at these like aliens are here. They're, they're going to give us technology. How interesting is that? We just have to say we have, we give them allowance into the population because they need to save their species and get some new genetics flowing into their species. This is the whole abduction scenario. Now at a certain mm. point, what we see with data is that yes, they did make that kind of a deal. There's nothing they can do about not making a deal though, because they're gonna do what they wanna do anyway, higher technology. While there was benefit to uh, black projects in receiving some of this technology, you know, it's like hand-me-downs though, like genes with holes in them. So what happens later on is that, that there is a growing realization that these guys are not good at all they gradually become adversaries to the groups who originally started working with them. Not all of them, because there's a lot of black project type groups. Some of them actually still work with these guys. But for the most part, the adversaries became the greys who originally came here to take genetic material from the human race. 
when you think about the the UFO wars that Ed Grimsley was filming that you can probably still see and the TR3B that is part of that fighting part of the war because under the surface there is a war going on with these beings these are also the ones who have a lot of setups <clears throat> on the moon who have literally um gone after um Ingo Swan talks about it the godfather of remote viewing created pretty much created remote viewing he talks about uh remote viewing the moon and the danger from the beings if they notice you when you remote view the moon so th these are the ones that are our adversaries and those are who he's referring to the party's over is really what it comes down to the party's over it was fun in the beginning it's not fun anymore yeah. Man, and, and that kind of brings us to this next question. Like if they're adversaries, we often think that, well, they must have far superior technology to ours. So how are we even competing? But there were claims that that these craft, there are methods to take these craft down. How is that possible? What's going on? Well, with you this? can like, take a household toaster and a light bulb and no, I'm just kidding. No, you, you, you like... <laughs> The way I was, I was willing to believe you for a second. Like, oh, everybody's going, what? I can get my. I was imagining the toaster and a light bulb, and I was like, he's going to throw them into a bathtub. It's going to create right, a exactly. metaphysical explosion and take the craft down. When we remote view Roswell, and other remote viewers have too, um, the Roswell crash, for instance, we've got this this uh, intense energetic type of radar pulse that collapsed. The magnetic field so you've got the craft who is creating its own magnetic field its own gravitational field right right if you have an opposing electromagnetic field gravitational field oh. in the air around it it can collapse that field and that power has to be stronger so so that literally mm. is how they take down the craft now today the technology is probably completely different than just radar. There's probably other things in it. Um, and so when people, when people make the statement, you know, if aliens are going to fly across the universe or come through a dimension, they obviously have very, very high technology, which they do. Why would they crash when they get to earth? Well, this was, this, this is, this is how it's done. It's by collapsing the gravitational electromagnetic field of these craft and they will be taken down. Um, and this is how the U.S. and probably other countries have gotten hold of a lot of these craft and why they have teams to retrieve these craft. Well, and, and um, they, if, if this is all true, they've been reverse engineering this stuff for 100 years or more. Well, OK, so I mean, not only reverse engineering, if you get to um, uh, Luis Rota, who I spoke about earlier. So in right. the early 1900s. He was a scientist who was very interested in telluric energy, which is an energy that moves through the earth. Mm -hmm. He had developed, based on electrostatic and electromagnetic field, a anti-gravity. He basically developed anti-gravity and created his aero radio ballistique. Mm -hmm. And that was just like this sort of like tinker toy uh, type looking craft. But inside of it are, are all of these um, components to create the electromagnetic and electrostatic field. And there was a press event about this where it actually hovered. So he got hired by um, British military at a certain point. And one of the things that he was an early developer of, or his ideas uh, were put forth then, was radar. So here we have this guy who understood the harmony of, of how electromagnetic fields work with each other. Now you, ha you have to have a lot of different electromagnetic fields in order to create the situation where you are going to get levitation. And he understood what those fields were. Now, the fact that he also worked on radar was, or was a precursor to the ideas around radar show that the same concepts are involved here. If you can form an electromagnetic field through these harmonies that cause lift, you can also pulse electromagnetic fields through specific harmonies to collapse that other electromagnetic field. And, and this is stuff that has been known about for it, you know, at least they started figuring it out without any craft back in the early 1900s. 
Right. So the, there's development from the reverse engineering, and then there's just common sense development of, of all of these electromagnetic technologies that humans have been doing anyway. You mix all of those together. You know, I think a lot of people were like, well, you know, why wouldn't they have a force field to protect it? But it's like, or something like some technology, but we're talking about, it is a technology. Like they've developed a technology that helps them fly through space. Every technology is going to have weak spots and it is right. the military's job to find those weak spots right. and to figure out how to take those things down. So it's not exactly. that much of a stretch of an imagination right. that they'd be able to do that. And, and my guess is that based off of earlier research, the military had figured back, you know, especially around Roswell, like we can collapse the magnetic field of these because we've got all these research that goes way back into the early 1900s. I think that that it was an intended consequence and not accidental. Yeah, I mean, they, they would have known that already. I mean, you get any yeah. super smart physicists in the room and they're they're figuring out what is causing the propulsion and the gravitational fields that are around these things. And you're going to come to a conclusion really fast about what to do and how to take them out. Right, exactly. Okay, so why has there been a UFO cover up at all? Oh, right. That whole thing. I mean, well, I, you know, from what we've seen, there's multiple reasons. Um, and, you know, someone like Schratt, for instance, and many other people who have investigated this think that it is solely based off of technology, technology that would be disruptive, hiding the technology that it would be. It's like Tesla and versus Edison. So who yeah. did JP Morgan or Rockefeller or whoever those guys, who did they invest in? when it came to um, electricity. They invested in Edison. Yes. Because the reason why, obviously, is because Tesla's was free energy. Like, how are you going to make a buck off free energy? I mean, they could have found ways, but Edison was a lot easier uh, on that. He, Edison was was more, was more better at playing the game. He, he was right. very... He was very good at at molding himself according to what was needed to get things done. I mean, a lot of people call him a genius in marketing because of how he was doing things at the time. And, and actually, Hey man, Betamax was way better than VHS. Like right. why do we even have VHS? Yeah, that's right. That is actually right. I mean, yes, it's a perfect example. And it's like, but, but at the same time, Edison wasn't a dummy. Like he was doing things when cars came out that people would be really surprised about. Like he made a, a battery powered car. He was working with Ford on, on different things. But obviously, it was like they're all answering up to someone who wants to see these things go into production, who are financing them or who control different industries. They're going to do the things that they need to get their ideas forward. They're not going to win on every single thing, even if it's a guy like Ford or Edison. There you have right. it. I mean, you've got like Edison definitely won over Tesla because Tesla wanted these things to be available for people. He wanted them to be free. And he had way more knowledge of this stuff than anyone else at the time. Right. So, I mean, think about now if, if free energy was introduced, non-polluting free energy into society would collapse a huge narrative. Well, for one, uh, carbon tax credits. I mean, heck, that's going to be a huge moneymaker in general. <laughs> What's going to happen to our cars, the whole industry around cars and gasoline and nah, 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 that, that, that people make tons of money off of? And that's the whole thing of it. It's like, if you really want to help the climate, Whatever people think is going on or not going on with the climate, helping the climate would be releasing free energy, ultimately at least releasing free energy. Well, and that's and the part that always gets me. It's like, how come yeah. the computer industry like shot forward uh, exponentially within, uh, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years, whereas gasoline rocketry is still way, 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 way back there. It doesn't make any sense, it makes zero sense. So they haven't fed the technology into the private sector on energy from these things. That's what they haven't done. It doesn't make any sense unless it was meant to be that way, which is right. what I think you're getting at, right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the story around that is a big, big rabbit hole. We're, we won't get too into that here. Right, we won't but, get into that. But but it is interesting that what you're bringing up about releasing the free energy and all of that free energy and all of that stuff is here we are 
we have a whistleblower that's come out that's talking about extremely exotic technologies where you know they have the answers to these things and they themselves haven't brought it out and they're complaining about climate change when they haven't right. answered the whole time. So right. what is actually going on here? Like when you start getting into that and you, you like, that'll keep you up at night. Cause you're like, you start to realize a whole lot of things about what's going on around us. You know what I mean? Right. Well, here's the other thing too. We would continue to have a climate change, whether we had no free energy what. or not. <laughs> well, uh, well and, and what is the climate change is the question, right? So like a lot of data is not necessarily being discussed and recognized when we've got right cycles that the sun goes through cycles that the earth goes through different forms of data that are should be looked at and may not be um you know the, these are these are things people need to wake up about i think so then we've yeah. got we've got another aspect of the cover up that has to do with um uh earth earth adversaries like like you know we're still in that state of tribal Right. warfare right where where sure. it's it's like we just want to have a leg up on the other guy so we can get his resources so there's still that that occurs which digs a deep hole for the stuff to sit inside of but then there's also the basic idea that the brookings report put forward brookings institution which was a think tank government think tank to come up with uh what should we do if aliens landed on earth should we tell the public or not and how would the public react well they determined that the public would completely lose their minds and then not look at the government as something of an authority anymore right so this is the reason why uh so we, so uh, we basically get these like three different reasons uh as far as why there's a cover-up going on for this yeah the 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 big questions we have to answer for everyone now really come down to like, look, there's a lot of discussion about whether Grush is being legit. I mean, he's so calc, whether he is legit, he's very calculated in what he says and how he says it. And a lot of people are upset that this information is coming out right now when they feel this is their political um, belief, you know, is that they feel like a lot of, a lot of things are, are being, swept under the rug because this information is out in the forefront. I mean, you've got CNN actually talking about this stuff, which surprising. That's surprising, actually. Like, why would that happen unless it was planned, unless it was a psychological operation? But then again, you go back, you look at these photos and you look at some of this other information about how their character assassinating this guy. Well, that doesn't really line up either. So is it a distract? Is this guy legit? That's the question. It's like, who is this guy? Why is he doing what he's doing? Is he coming out because this is a bigger operation or is he coming out because he really wants this information out there or something else? Yeah, right. So looking at that, looking at that particular thing. Now, when a person gets involved in the whole UFO whistleblower uh, situation, um, I do believe that there are embedded within that whole uh, arena are are operatives who are working to get people to go down pathways that would compromise them. With Grush, what we saw was that he seemed to understand. He So he knows way more than what he's saying, obviously, mm. because of the whole, well, we can only talk about this in a skiff because it's it's too sensitive. That it's, it's, it's highly classified information. So what we see is that it seems as though he came across stuff, information, he may have even had experiences or seen things that he wasn't supposed to ultimately, wasn't supposed to have gone after, wasn't supposed to have seen. And the fact that he became outwardly curious about it, being in the position that he was in to start investigating it was going to get him basically killed. Like that would get him killed. So what he's doing is he is trying to move into a position where he doesn't get killed based on everything that he knows and everything that he's potentially experienced. Oh, now, that's not to say now that within the whole whistleblower construct, there aren't these prongs going into him to get him to move in specific directions because of other people's agendas, because that's all embedded in that as well. Uh, but his original intention, as far as we've seen, is clean. And it has to do with I'm going to be killed. If I don't do this, if I don't find this big padding around me, I'm going to be killed. 
based on what I've seen, what I know. This guy on the upper left-hand corner, I'm pretty sure he's the Navy SEAL guy that just interviewed Eric Hecker. Yeah, this is him. That's him. Yeah, Sean so this, Ryan. Sean Ryan. That's right. The Sean Ryan show. He does a great job. He actually does everything himself. He has this like badass background that he created himself and he films the whole thing and edits it himself. And Eric Hecker anyway was on his show. And uh, we actually talked. We I think we do talk about that in one of our Antarctica episodes that are coming up. So we'll be getting into that. Uh, I am a little bit surprised that he's here. I guess he's really curious about this whole discussion on on UFOs, UAPs. Um, what really shocked me about what you said is that this almost seems to be a chess move that Grush had to make in order to protect yeah. him and his family's life or something. Right. Because that's, that's what it was like. Yeah. He got too he got too involved. He was too curious. He got in in and he saw that, okay, this could put my life in danger. I'd better go public so that it makes it much more difficult for anything to happen to me. Like it was it then that would have to be his only move because that doesn't necessarily like being in the public eye doesn't necessarily protect you from forces that don't want you to do something. So that to me is communicating back, being backed in the corner. And then if you pull that image up again, obviously he's in front of a lot of people, but this expression on his face, this deer in headlights of, of like what's behind there could be some terror in there. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I mean, you see in his eyes. Yeah. You know, it's not fair to necessarily judge off of one photo, obviously, but there is something about this that the story that you just shared would make the most sense to me, even. Because why are they why are they character assassinating him if this was all a big psychological operation? Right. So now have they said that he was suicidal in the past? And if they have said that he was suicidal in the past, that's an opening for them. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean. They have they have said that. Yeah, I think in those so, in those new. Hey, he uh, just committed suicide. What are you going to do? He was he was distraught, right? Well, and he needs to probably publicly announce that that's not something he would do or ever do. Well, and and yeah. I mean, who hasn't? When everyone anyone's going through a really hard time, who hasn't made casual suicidal statements? People go through hard times and, and, you know, at least a lot of friends that I have, when you talk to them about it, they get to a state where they're like, I felt at my lowest. I felt like I wanted to just not continue, but somehow I found the strength to keep going. During those times is when you sometimes when the most growth happens. Um, right. So, you know, I don't think it's fair to judge someone based off of one one point like that you know well like i say i mean they could be setting this whole thing up from first That's showing scary. what they want people to think of him as being crazy just the photos not putting any words around it just the photos second step is to say well he's got ptsd he's acted out he's got in trouble with the police because of you know his his volatile nature and then they slip in there he was suicidal at one point Oh, right? man, you're so right. I yeah, I like I feel scared for this dude now. I right. uh, I hope I hope that um all of this kind of goes as smoothly as possible and there is no loss of life if that's even a thing. So you guys, we we went through all of this information. We talked a lot about, you know, these exotic propulsions and and technologies and stuff. And I think at least with this whole UFO discussion with David Grush, we, we can kind of wrap it up here in this episode. However, in our next episode, we are going to start getting into the aftermath, which is what about all of these other whistleblowers that have come out to discuss these things over the last, who, who knows, 30 years? And Michael Schratt, who we're going to reference, has a lot of this information. We're going to get into some of that. John's remote viewed a lot of this, uh, some of these technologies and some of these issues revolved around Shrat and his whistleblower's claims. We're going to be getting into that, but we'd love to know what you think. How are we doing? Um, you guys like this show? Do you like um, these episodes on UFOs? Would you like us to do more on it? Uh, or, or do you like more of the uh, content that's, um, you know, more explorational, uh, where we're discussing science, physics, um, getting out there into, you know, architecture um, or archaeological finds and things like that, rather. So 
definitely let us know what you think in the comments below. John, thanks so much for being here with us. And uh, yeah, we hope you guys thought this episode was as out of this world as we did.